Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Shouse and Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations is the rulebook that the federal government must follow in making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It's complimentary and recorded. We'll post all the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veteran Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please, please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We'd also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact below at jenniferschaus.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we'd like to let you know about some ways to reach the government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jenniferschaus.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Mary Beth Bosco. You can find her information on the screen here. And today we're covering FAR Part 33 with Mary Beth. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure with the delay. Hi, everyone. Um, I, um, I hope everybody is uh, healthy and safe, and thanks for listening in. Um, can you please advance the slides? Um, FAR Part 33 is basically the litigation section of the Federal Acquisition Regulation. It covers claims against the government, government claims against the contractor, and protests. You know, I'm going to let you in on a government contract and we're a secret. Um, it, is, it is one system for filing claims for litigation against the government. And what I mean by that is there's basically the FAR, that, that's your rule. And then it's um, federal law. There's sort of a, a body of law that's federal contract law. So we don't have to worry about um, you know, what state we're in or what state law. We have to we go back to the FAR and then to the procedures of the various um, uh, tribunals that hear these claims. So we're going to cover claims today and appeals. You know, why do you file a claim? What is in it? What's the process, and so what are some of the common issues that arise when we're litigating the claim against the government? And then we'll switch to good protests. Uh, again, we'll do an overdue overview. Uh, how do you file a protest? What the basics? You know, where you can go, and what are some of the common uh, interests? Yeah. Next slide, please. So a claim is. Uh, basically, any dispute you have with the government that arises under or is related to a contract. So if it touches your contract with the federal government, this is the process you need to, to follow. So typically, you're looking at disputes over some aspect of performance um, of the contract, things like um, scheduling delays, um, inability to agree on a termination for convenience settlement, uh, withholding of costs by the government. Um, and then sort of the big one we'll talk about a little bit later is um, constructive changes. And the constructive change is when you believe that the government has changed the work under the contract but it's not issued a change order. So in that case, um, you're supposed to give the government notice that you consider it a change, um, but that rule is basically observed more in the breach. Next slide, please. So a claim um, basically uh, has to have specific 
things in it where it'll get kicked back. Uh, the Contract Disputes Act is the statute that governs um, litigation against the government, um, and then it's carried out through the FAR. So, in order to file a valid claim, you have to, it has to be in writing. It has to be for a sum certain. It has to um, describe the facts and arguments underlying the claim. And it has to request a contracting officer's final decision. Some people will file what's called a request for equitable adjustment first. And that's sort of a kick kickoff event um, that, you know, you, you file it, you, you hope that the, you and the government can negotiate a settlement. If that doesn't work, you ratchet up and go on to filing a claim. Uh, next slide. The, really the hardest thing or the thing that is most controversial about claims is the certification requirement. Um, can you advance to the next claim? Every claim over $100,000 needs to be certified. In other words, it has to have a certification that is signed by somebody with the authority to bind the contractor. And it says that um, it, you know, that the amount that you're claiming, that you do for that claim, that you do, you are truly due that amount. That the claim is um, accurate and complete and current, and that you've got the authority to sign that certification. Can we go to the next slide? And for some reason, it's not advancing for me. Um, so one of the things about certifications, um, are, even though what's in them is pretty um, you know, set forth in the FAR, um, very often contractors will uh, not follow this exact language, like they try and you know, mess around with it, well, don't ever do that. Because if it's not proper certification, the government will kick the claim back to you and make you resubmit it. And the reason that that's something that you don't want to have happen, in addition to delay, is that interest on your claim begins to accrue on the date of submission of a certified claim. So uh, the sooner you get the claim in, the sooner you start the interest clock should you prevail. Now, you know, back in the day when interest rates were, you know, relatively high or much higher than that today, that was a huge consideration. But uh, unfortunately for all of us, the interest rates are so low, um, you know, this may not uh, turn out to be a huge amount at the end of the day. And next slide, please. So once you submit your claim, what's the process? What happens next? The um, contracting officer receives the claim and has a certain amount of time to um, respond to the claim. Can we advance the slides? Basically, the contracting officer has 60 days after you submit your claim to make its decision. Now, I think in the history of the world, very rarely does the contracting officer hit that 60 day limit. So um, they give themselves extensions. They are supposed to send you the letter saying, you know, it's very complicated, I'm going to need more time, and I'm giving myself another 60 days. And unfortunately, there's really nothing you can do about that. Now, if the um, amount of time gets to be unreasonable, um, you can consider your claim to be deemed denied, and therefore, you can go ahead and appeal the contracting officer's decision. Next slide. Like the claim itself, 
the contracting officer's final decision has to have certain things in it. It has to, you know, state the basis for um, why the claim is granted or denied, and it also has to advise you of your appeal rights. Can we go to the next claim? I mean, the next slide. Now, one other thing is that um, the contracting officer does not have authority over a claim that the contracting officer believes to involve fraud. So if the CO believes that it's a fraudulent claim, uh, the CO will uh, kick the claim basically to the inspector general or whoever at the agency is responsible for investigating fraud. You will sometimes see um, a government official use this as a threat to get bargaining leverage. Um, obviously, they're not supposed to do that, but um, you know it does happen. So if it occurs, in your case, I think the best thing to do is take a good hard look at the claim and decide whether or not you want to go forward with it. Next slide, please. Now, not only can a contractor file a claim against the government, but the government can file a claim against the contractor. So just like for contracting, uh, contractors' claims, the government has to put it in writing, right? What's the reason? What's the amount? Um, and also notify the contractor of the debt deferment process. Think to yourself, uh, the subject of a government claim, um, there uh, are avenues of relief. You can elect to defer payment of the claim. Um, you know, which which is in some cases um, a really important capability. Um, again, what happens is you will then basically um, you can take that contracting officer's final decision and start the appeals process, um, or you could go back to the contracting officer and see if you can. Um, you know, negotiate, give them more uh, backup data, um, and see if you can get the, the COFD withdrawn. Um, there is a six year statute of limitations upon claims by either the contractor or the government, um, and the six years starts from the time that the claim accrues. That is a somewhat you know, big, ambiguous and broad term, and that is often the subject of a fight between the government and the contractor. Does the claim accrue um, upon the first day that the government's action took place? Does the action have to be complete? Um, those are the types of issues that arise around the statute of limitations in government contracts. Next slide, please. Alternate dispute resolution is also available at any time during the claim and appeals process. Um, either party can, can request ADR, and um, in order for it to be used, both parties have to agree to it. If the contractor requests ADR and the contracting officer does not want to proceed with ADR, then that decision, decision gets kicked upstairs one level uh, for a further review by a, 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 an official, at least a level above the um, contracting officer. And, and that's because the government wants to encourage um, some type of alternate dispute resolution rather than litigating claims. There is no binding arbitration um, relating to claims, and um, you know you still have to uh, 
uh, have a COSD to start with, um, and and they don't. Um, you know, ha going into ADR does not stop the appeals clock at all. Uh, like I said, the government is is a big proponent of ADR, and you can ask to visit the contracting officer. You can ask for it um, once you take an appeal. So it's always something to keep in mind. Next claim, please. So once you get either a denial of your claim or the government asserts a claim against you, you can appeal that contracting officer final decision. And you basically have two places to go for that first appeal. One is one of the boards of contract appeals. There are now three. The Armed Services, the Civilian Board that covers, you know, the civilian agencies, transportation, agriculture, GSA, et cetera, and the Postal Service. There used to, every agency basically used to have their own Board of Contract Appeals, but several years ago, um, they made the decision to consolidate them. So you basically have defense and civilian. The second place you, have, you can go is the Court of Federal Claims. That's a court that sits in Washington, D.C., and they only have jurisdiction over uh, two or three causes of action. One is government contract claims, two patent claims. They also have um, some uh, vaccine cases, so they tend to be... Um, you know, focused on the subject matter, although I will caveat that in that most that a government, um, a judge on the Court of Federal Appeals does not really have to have experience with government contractors. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the differences, you've got to make a decision, you know, where do you want to go? Do you go to the board or do you go to the Court of Federal Claims? So the first decision point is, if you want to go to the board, you have to get your appeal in within 90 days um, of the contracting officer final decision. The Court of Federal Claims, you actually have a full year to file um, your appeal. In neither forum do you get a jury. It's a three-judge panel that makes the decision at the Board of Contract Appeals, although you will basically appear before and see only one judge, and then uh, the panel will get together to make the decision. Same thing over at the Court of Federal Claims. It is a decision by a single judge. And um, at the Board of Contract Appeals, the judges you know, are knowledgeable about government contractors at the Court of Federal Claims, um, that is not always the case. You might draw a judge who mostly does patent cases. Um, so that's, you know, an issue to think about over at what we call COPSI. If you take an appeal to the Board of Contracting Appeals, the agency will be represented by an agency lawyer. If you go over to the Court of Federal Claims, you'll get an attorney from the Department of Justice. And, um, you know, sometimes that's an advantage because it's really somebody coming in and looking at the case with a you know, fresh set of eyes and isn't invested in it as much as the agency would be. Um, in terms of procedures, um, both courts, both the board and courts, have um, formalized their rules, but over at the board, they're, you know, they're a little less formalized. There's a little bit more room to do things uh, a little bit differently. Um, what differs over at the board of contract, um, of contract appeals is that after you file your appeal, the government makes what's called a rule four file. And that file is supposed to contain all of the documents that are relevant to the appeal. Over at the Court of Federal Claims, the rules are based on the civilian rules of civil procedure, the federal rules of civil procedure. 
so it is, um, you know, discovery proceeds with interrogatories, depositions, et cetera, wherein, whereas at the board, you're looking at your rule four file, that's the first thing you get. Um, like we said, ADR is available um, at both places, and we do have some discovery, although discovery at the Court of Federal Claims is usually, um, um, in a sense, the court has more authority or is more likely to compel the government to produce things. So that's, a, you know, perhaps another advantage. In terms of expense, both of them are, you know, you consider litigation. So, um, you know, I don't personally think there's a whole lot of, of difference between the expense of the board appeal versus the COPSI appeal. Some people tend to think COPSI is more expensive. In terms of timing, I think the boards um, are probably faster to get to a decision um, than the Court of Federal Claims. Next slide, please. If you um, want to appeal your uh, decision, if you get an, uh, an adverse decision on a board um, or at the Court of Federal Claims, you go to the same place. You go to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And that's an appellate court that uh, sits in Washington, D.C. And um, again, it, its procedures are the, basically the same as the federal rules of appellate procedure. Um, can you advance the slide, please? Now that we've got the process down, I thought we'd just take a minute to talk about some of the um, you know, pitfalls or the issues that commonly come up. And probably the first one is proof of damages and supporting documentation. So, for example, if you are working on a contract and you believe the government has changed the contract, the best thing you can do is um, implement what we call change order accounting. And that would be you would, you would Try to separate as best you could the labor costs that were caused by the change in the contract or material costs. So that when it's time to um, file your claim, you've got all the you know proof of damages that you need, and you're not going back trying to reconstruct things. Um, very often, both the board and the court of federal claims will bifurcate the case. So you'll have an entitlement portion, and then if you win entitlement, you go on to damages. And, um, you know, it's, it, it is not uncommon to see um, a contractor win um, on the merits, but then when they get to, um, you know, what the quantum of the claim should be, they don't, they might not have adequate support for the amount of damages. Um, you would think that you could, you know, say, okay, the contract is going to cost me you know, X number of dollars, and because of your change, I spent X plus, you know, $5,000. It's the $5,000 delta. The government doesn't, judges don't go for that. They don't go for that total cost. And then another, just another issue briefly is authority of the government. Probably a lot of you have. Um, seen this happen where you're you know, performing your contract and you know somebody from the project office says, "Hey, could you do this for me? Um, I'll take care of it. You know, it'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll get you know you'll get paid." Well, a person from the project office has no authority to to bind the government. So unless it comes from the contracting officer, you will find yourself. Um, defending your own claim, uh, trying to argue that the person who told you to do, um, what, you know, what you consider the change to be, didn't have the authority to do it, and it's just null and void. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, which is protest. So this is also, um, uh, you know, good protests are very unique to government contracts. 
And basically, you are either going to protest the terms of the solicitation, saying that it's, you know, unduly restrictive or has other flaws, or you're going to challenge the award decision. Um, there are um, several jurisdictional hurdles that you need to um, you need to clear in order to bring a protest. First, you have to be what's called an interested party, and that's somebody whose economic interests uh, will be affected by the uh, protest. And of course, most often uh, the protest is brought by the dis uh, disappointed bidder. You also have to have suffered prejudice. So another way of saying this is, if, you know, if if the uh, proposal is ranked one to five, and you're number five, and you want to bring a protest, right? You're going to have to show that one, two, three, and four above you would have gotten, you know, were not eligible for award. If you don't, then you have not suffered prejudice because you wouldn't have gotten the award otherwise. Um, protests, uh, the deadlines are most important. They are set forth in the FAR. You will also see some in GAO's rules and the Competition in Contracting Act, which is the statute governing uh, protests, contain the rules. So they are confusing and you should always consult counsel. The basic rule that you should always keep in mind is that if you file a protest at either GAO or the agency within um, either 10 days of award or um, five days after required debriefing, the government has to stop award or stop performance from moving forward unless the government makes a determination that there's an urgent and compelling need to go forward. Um, it, it, you know, that's what's called the secret stay. Uh, it's, uh, it's a cheap injunction. So it's a, um, it's a very important tool in bid protest, but you could um, miss it if you miss the deadlines. Next slide. So you, now you want to decide, should you file the protest or not? Do you have grounds? And um, in most cases, um, in what we call FAR Part 15 procurements, right, your typical negotiated um, or competitive bid contract, the agency has to give you a debriefing. You've got to ask for the debriefing within three days of notified, being notified you didn't get the award. And um, what happens is, in some cases, you will meet with the agency. In other cases, they do it by phone. In some cases, they do it by letter. And um, there are certain things that the agency has to tell you in a debriefing, and there are certain things that they can't tell you. Next slide, please. So basically, in a debriefing, the contracting officer will, um, and other agency officials, will basically walk you through the pro your proposal, and they will you know, go through your strengths, your weaknesses. Um, you will get um, a comparison of the prices, total price, not really a breakdown. And you're also allowed to ask questions. It, could we advance the slides, please? So a debriefing is free discovery. Um, and, you know, each agency, each contracting officer varies in terms of how forthcoming they're going to be in a debriefing. Um, sometimes you go to the debriefing and the agency is very convincing and you, you walk out of it and say, we thought we had grounds going in, we don't have grounds now. In other cases, the information you learn in the debriefing will form the basis for your uh, protest. Uh, next slide, please. One question we get a lot is, um, do you recommend bringing a lawyer and outside counsel into a debriefing? And, 
uh, my answer is almost always no, because once you bring a lawyer, they get their lawyer, and it gets elevated, and you're not going to find any good information in the debriefing. They're just not going to, you know, they're just not going to be as open as perhaps they would be if it were just, you know, business people from the company. So we could begin the next slide. There are three places. If you decide from the debriefing, you know what, we do have grounds to go. Um, where do you go to file a protest? So there are three options. One is to the agency. One is to the General Accountability Office, or GAO. And the third is to the Court of Federal Claims, COSPI. Can we advance the slide? Um, there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to all three of these forms. Um, the agency protest is the simplest. An agency protest really starts out with a letter and a brief to your contracting officer saying that, you know, we disagree with the award decision, setting forth, you know, the issues that we see. It's completely a paper uh, procedure. The contracting officer has 35 days to respond to, um, uh, you know, a protest, um, but there's really, it's really it's a loose number. It's not, you know, sort of aspirational. You don't really get to ask the agency any questions. It's basically you submit your reason for protesting, and they submit back their reason for either granting or denying the protest. Um, can we advance the slide? This so the um, other um, sort of you know, factors you weigh in you know, where you're going to go is that if you file an agency level protest uh, in the amount of time within those deadlines we just talked about, you will get that automatic stay. Um, it's not going to be an independent decision maker because the decision on your protest will, um, you know, is going to be made either by the contracting officer or somebody uh, level above him. Um, it is, you know, certainly the least expensive. I, uh, my recommendation is usually pre, um, agency level protests are um, sometimes a useful tool before award if you're protesting the solicitation terms because um you know often if there's really a problem the agency will um, take corrective action and change um, uh, change the solicitation the gao is the next place you would go or another place to go it also you get that automatic stay you get access to the agency documents. Um, the agency files what is called an administrative record um, within 30 days of the protests. Um, the protester is allowed time to review and comment on the agency report. The protester will have 10 days um, to submit their comments. It is an independent decision maker because the decision is made by the GAO attorney who hears the protest. The GAO attorney has 100 business days to make their decision. So if you file a protest, you get the stay of a rule you basically got um, a four-month period where the contract will be stayed. Another important factor I think to think about uh, for both GAO and the Court of Federal Claims is they will issue a protective order. Um, and what that means is basically no one from the company can see most of the documents in the uh, agency record because they're considered to be competition sensitive. So because of that protective order, um, 
uh, you almost always have to hire, excuse me, hire an attorney um, in order to effectively prosecute the protest because you will not be able to see um, what's in the protest record. Um, next slide. The last place you can go is the Court of Federal Claims. Um, you don't get the secret stay at Copsey. You have to go in, file a complaint, and make a motion for um, an injunction, a temporary screening order, or a preliminary injunction. And then the court will either decide it um, or sometimes the agency will voluntarily say, you know, we'll stop. We'll, we'll, we will you know, not to take any actions while this protest is pending. There is a um, protective order like a GAO. You will get a DOJ attorney on the other side. It typically um, it typically um, takes six months, but there's no time limit. Um, you know, you get discovery, the agency again files a record, um, there's briefing of the record, and it is, you know, I think most definitely the most expensive of the three protest options. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of you know, strategic considerations, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, what's the, first of all, what's the victory and what are the chances of getting it? And I say that because sometimes you go to GLO and they'll say, we agree with you, the, um, you know, the evaluation was not done properly and they'll send the case back to the agency to do a new evaluation. And of course, um, that might mean that they just make the same decision again. So the first thing you need to think about is, you know, even if we win, are we going to lose? And if that's the scenario, how much are we going to anger uh, our agency? Could we advance the slide? Um, so that's, that's a one issue. Um, second, neither, none, neither the board, um, the agency, GAO, or COPSI will um, order that a contract be awarded to a specific bidder. Instead, their, go their decisions will say things like, um, if they grant the protest, you know, you've got to go back and reevaluate, or, you know, you've got to go back and fix the solicitation. It does not... Um, um, guarantee an outcome. In terms of GAO, GAO publishes statistics. So in uh, 2019, there were a uh, little under 2,200 protest filed. Only 77 were sustained, but it had the, the contractors had what we call uh, an effectiveness rate. Of 44%, and what's meant by that is that the effectiveness rate counts both decisions that are favorable, and also um, if the agency takes corrective action as a result of the protest. So that's basically, um, you know, that's basically your odds, and that 44% effective rate has is pretty, you know, steady from year to year. Uh, next slide, please. If you get a no from either GAO or um, the Court of Federal Claims, if you could advance about four slides, um, you have an appeal um, it, that goes to the Court of Federal Claims for the Federal Circuit. They do, it's not a typical review in that they are not reviewing um, uh, the decision so much of the court uh, of the um, uh, you know of the court on matters of fact they can some they will sometimes go ahead and look at you know what the agency did um, you know I, I think there's a mixed record of winning at the appellate court but um, you know many companies who feel very strongly about their case will go up to the federal circuit. 
Um, before I close, I think when we're thinking about a protest, in addition to is a win a win, um, you need to think about um, will the protest impact your relationship with the contracting agency? It shouldn't. It should be a matter, you know, just that this is the cost of doing business, but sometimes it does. Um, would you get more? what I'd say, points from the agency if you don't file a protest, but you go in and talk to the agency and tell them, you know, what you think went wrong and, um, you know, basically say, we were going to protest, but, you know, we decided not to. So, you know, we hope you recognize that. Um, it is also getting more uh, increasingly expensive because at GAO, in most cases, agency would file the report, you'd file comments, that would be pretty much it. But we've noticed a trend recently that the GAO attorney will come in after you file your comments and, and have a round of questions. So you wind up um, having to submit, um, you know, certainly more beliefs than you thought you were going to. Um, you know, the, the alternative is sometimes, you know, I've seen disappointed bidders approach the winning bidder and see if they can get, um, you know, some part of that work. So, um, you know, the, 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 you've got a decision once you get your, once you get your um, uh, information together, if you decide to go forward, you've got, you've got three places to think about. And with that, I think I have um, finished my presentation. And again, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to um, attend this. All right. Um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Really appreciate your time. Uh, and to our audience members, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.